Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to the Bible study on uh, the book of Acts, where we're using the Venerable Bede, the great Western father of the pre schism church, English father, as our main source. We'll also refer to you know, the Blessed Theophylact, seminary notes, various other things, but we're going to take Venerable Bede as our main source. Uh, we're going to be doing chapter two today. Uh, before we get started, I want to say. <clears throat> That I just want a quick little announcement. I have it's been up for a while, but I translated a, an, an Akathis to Father Daniel Sosoa that was originally written in Romanian. It was then translated into Russian, actually not Slavonic, but into Russian, and I translated it from Russian to English. That is available for five dollars, and there'll be info in the video description of how to get a hold of that. And also, I've translated a book on Saint Gabriel Workabadzi, the Fool for Christ of Georgia, the Great Father great father of our times he only reposed in the 90s that's been fully translated a full-length biography uh it's currently being edited it should be published in the fall and we have an indigo indiegogo fundraiser going uh where we're trying to get some support just to you know so the editor can get paid so that i can get paid as a translator uh, and if we make extra money it'll just go towards the printing costs and we're offering some perks there you can get free books free copies of the book free gifts uh, for an e-copy of the book, uh, and even if you, you know, donate enough, we can. We're offering a. We'll we'll submit your name here to Stratensky Monastery, so that they will commemorate liturgy every day for a year. Um. So, okay, Acts chapter two. Let's remember, um, well, Acts chapter one. The basic thing was, well, the ascension of Christ happens. Right? That's the main, I guess, the main event in Acts chapter 1. Christ ascends. He returns to heaven. And they watch him go up. The angels appear and say, hey, what are you watching? And they say, he'll be back, right? So uh, let's take a look at Acts. Let's dive right into Acts chapter 2. And it begins with, after the ascension, the next great feast, the Feast of Pentecost. We're just going to go verse by verse, focusing on what the Venerable Bede and others say. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So Bede here mentions that this was the same upper room that was mentioned in chapter one. Of course, upper room can make us think of uh, holy, the mystical supper on Holy Thursday. Just upper ascending. These are always, you know, this always means closer to God, closer to heaven, right? Noah and the ark rest, it came to rest on a high mountain. The, uh, the Tower of Babel was the problem that they were trying to ascend to God, but on in, according to their own terms, Adam and Eve tried to ascend to God according to their own terms. But so it's no it's no accident that uh, this is happening in an upper room. And again, we note that they were all with one accord; they were in harmony. The early Christians were all following the apostolic doctrine. The apostles were preaching that which Christ taught them. The early Christians um, were all in harmony in what they believed, and that's why they could pray and worship together. The rule of prayer is the rule of faith, and vice versa. They were all in one accord. And the Venerable Bede jumps, he just jumps right in, starts talking about re receiving the Holy Spirit. Of course, we know that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. We're not quite to that verse yet, but he just jumps right in and he says, Whoever desires to be filled with the Holy Spirit, must transcend the abode of the flesh by contemplation of the mind. Um, I'm not certain, they didn't do a word search, but I would guess the mind here, he's talking about mind, intellect, the noose, right? Contemplation of the mind. It's not just sitting thinking about something. It's a spiritual contemplation, something deeper. You're transcending the abode of the flesh, right? You're ascending to the upper room. So he says, whoever desires to be filled with the Holy Spirit must you must transcend your flesh and enter into a contemplation, noetic contemplation. He says, you know, the ascension of the Lord happened after 40 days. He said that that period of 40 days when Christ was with them, that represents the present pilgrim state of the church. The church is like a pilgrim on earth as it rises with Christ. He says, so the 50th day, this day when Pentecost happens, this is when the Holy Spirit was received. He says, this represents the perfection of blessed, the blessed rest of eternity that the church will receive as a reward for its temporal labors. So the 40 days is more of like the temporal labors, our time here on earth. 50 days is uh, 
the blessed rest of eternity. You know, 50, 50 is kind of like it's seven times seven and then one more. It's like the eighth day, right? You got seven days and then the eighth day is uh, the day of the Lord. It's eternity. So here we have 50 is seven times seven and then one more. He then turns to 2 Corinthians 4.17, which reads that for our minor tribulation at the present time is working out for us an eternal weight of glory that is sublime beyond measure. Okay, so again, our the tribulation of our present time, this time on earth, is working out an eternal weight of glory for us. So it's both the, our, our time on earth, blessed rest in eternity, as he said. He says, the true blessedness of body and soul is in being satisfied by the eternal vision of the Trinity, body and soul. We know that in orthodoxy, uh, even the vision of Christ in glory, the physical eyes do see it. it. It also transcends physical vision, but the physical eyes are involved and it transcends our, it transfigures our bodies as well. Christ's, Christ's body, of course, is transfiguring. That's no accident. He says, Bede says, the perfect denarius of life is that we are to take delight in the present vision of divine glory. Uh, and he says the historical sense here, you know, there he's giving, you know, deeper spiritual meanings, but he says the historical sense is that, okay, it's the 50th day. It's a commemoration of when the law was given, right? Pentecost was already a Jewish feast. And that's why so many Jews were in Jerusalem on this day. The 50th day commemorates when the law was given. Uh, it's counted from the day of the killing of, killing of the Paschal lamb, right? The Passover lamb. Uh, for us, it's counted not from the day of the killing of the lamb, not from Holy Friday, but it's counted from the day of Pascha, right? For the Jews, it's like Passover was the height. For us, Passover, uh, the killing of the Paschal lamb, it continues. Christ rests in the tomb. It continues. It fulfills in his resurrection. And so Pentecost comes 50 days later for us. He says, just as God descended upon Mount Sinai in fire, so on Pentecost, he descends as tongues of fire, right? Moses entered into that divine glory. His face shone, right? There was fire and thunder and lightning and everything when, when God appeared on Mount Sinai. So here the, on Pentecost, God himself descends as tongues of fire. Verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Here St. Bede quotes St. Gregory the Great, where he talks about that God was neither the sound nor the fire, but what God exhibits exteriorly is expressed by what he brought about interiorly. He says, for because he caused the disciples to be internally inflamed with zeal and skilled in words, externally there showed forth tongues of fire, right? The tongues of fire are, well, it's really, it's God descending in the form of tongues of fire. But why is God, why is God taking that form? Because it's showing that they're being internally inflamed with zeal, right? That's one, one, one thing that we can take out from it. And plus, it reminds me, Gregory is saying God is neither the sound nor the fire. This reminds me of the episode with the prophet Elijah. God was neither, you know, uh, God wasn't in the whirlwind, right? God was in the still small voice, the rushing mighty wind. This is often a sign of the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Blessed Theophilact says that the Holy Spirit filled the entire house, right? It said if the sound of the mighty wind filled the house, he did this to show that the gift wasn't for anyone individually. It wasn't a separate thing. No, it did rest on everyone individually, but it rested on everyone. It wasn't just for specific people, but for the entire church. So he says the house here is a symbol of the church. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So, okay, it is in, it's, it's communal, and yet it's individual. So Bede says the Holy Spirit appeared in fire and tongue because he makes men to burn and to speak. He also indicates that the church will spread and speak in the languages of all nations, right? Tongues of fire. They will go forth and convert the entire world, which requires them to be able to communicate with the entire world, right? The tongues of fire sit upon each of them. God God rests in his saints. God rests on his saints. God rests in his saints, right? We are to become God's lasting and permanent 
residence. God, Christ says, you know, he and the Father take up his, their abode in us. Christ is knocking at the door of our hearts. He wants to take up residency in us. Theophylact also says that the fire resting on their heads is an image of ordination, right? The laying on of hands on the head. We still see that today. You know, that's still how it happens today. The bishop puts his hands on the heads. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> so on Mount Sinai, again, going back to the, the first Pentecost, you could say, because Pentecost comes to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. God's presence was accompanied by fire, smoke, sound of thunder, as we've said. That's in Exodus 19. So at Pentecost, his presence was accompanied by the sound of wind, the tongues of fire, the gifts of tongues. Obvious, obvious, very obvious, clear parallels here. And of course, I think many of us know this, right? They begin to speak with other tongues. This is an undoing of the curse of the Tower of Babel, right? Talked about how they, they tried to build a tower to heaven. God was displeased. They were trying to ascend to heaven uh, on their according to their own terms. And so God confused their tongues so that they couldn't you know, work together for to such ends, right? So God confused their tongues. Bede says, spiritually, however, the variety of languages signifies the gifts of a variety of graces, right? So there, as we see, we'll see they're literally being heard. Men of all languages are hearing them, uh, but it also signifies the gifts of a variety of graces. And also we can say on a deeper level, uh, the languages were literally confused at Babel, but in, in scripture, lip, your tongue, uh, this refers to like what name is on your on your lip? What what is your confession? Who are you con who are you worshiping? It refers to your religion. Not only were their languages confused, but their religion was confused. Right? What God are you calling upon? Um, we can think about think. Let's think about Zephaniah three nine. It says, "For then I, for then will I turn to the people a pure language, a pure tongue, a pure lip." that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent, right? So when they all call upon the name of the Lord, that's a pure language. This was confused to Babel because they rebelled against God. And so you, know, you rebel against God, you uh, one error leads to many more. So the errors of false religions were only multiplied. And if you remember, if you watched the first, first lecture, we mentioned parallels between the book of Acts and the book of Joshua. So in Joshua, you know, verses chapters three to six, Israel had to cross the Jordan River and they circumcised themselves, right? These are both prefigurements of baptism. You know, obviously crossing the Jordan, right? Passing through water and then circumcising because circumcision is how the men um, entered the covenant. St. Peter makes the explicit, explicitly makes the connection between baptism and, and uh, circumcision and baptism. In baptism, we circumcise our hearts. So in the New Testament, river crossings, washings, circumcisions, these all come together into baptism. So the Jews cross the Jordan and then circumcise themselves, and here we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if we turn to Theophilact, he says in the Old Testament, the law was given on Pentecost on tablets, right? Now the injunction of the Holy Spirit is given, but not inscribed on stone, not on tablets, but in our hearts, right? The law was given on Pentecost, now the law of grace we could say grace which fulfills the law uh the law told us what to do what not to do but grace leads us into how to be more so not just do don't but be this way don't be this way it's more like you know in christ in the sermon on the mount christ is not just saying do this and don't do that he's saying let me reveal my own life to you you know uh yeah, he's revealing the inner life of God, and grace enables us to take that up as well, to enter into that life, to experience taste of that life. So in the Old Testament, the law is given on tablets. Now grace comes into our hearts. He says other tongues. He says what's happening here on the day of Pentecost was real languages, right? This enabled them to spread the gospel. And he emphasizes as the Spirit gave them utterance, right? As the Spirit gave them utterance, the saints 
don't speak from themselves, right? Often people say, you know, in the church, we can, even in Orthodox people we can hear, ah, oh, the saints say this and that. Well, the saints aren't perfect, you know, the saints... We don't have to believe the saints. True, the saints aren't perfect. There isn't some there isn't some charisma, charism of infallibility where we are bound by every word of the saints. But it's also not the business of the saints to go around just casting around and throwing around their uh, private opinions just for fun, right? Even their opinions are even if it's an opinion, it's sanctified. It's it's coming from a place of prayer. From they have they're saints because they have experiences of God. Don't you think that? purifies people every aspect there's no aspect of man that's unpurified right this is a big debate in the early church how how human was christ was he really fully human was there a part of humanity that he didn't take on did he have a human will did he really have a human soul uh did he have a human mind right or was there something he left out right so it's it's the same with the saints and while theosis is a process it, it affects the entire body, the entire human, the entire man. So as the Spirit gave them utterance, that is how the saints speak. Jesus began his ministry with baptism by the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus began, he was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Then he went into the wilderness to fight Satan. Then in John 2, he goes soon at, right after and he cleanses the temple. So in Acts, the Holy Spirit comes, he baptizes the church, and thereby cleanses God's temple, right? Uh, you know, the temple was God's house, you know, the glory cloud, you know, the glory of God is there. But then the Holy Spirit comes down. He brings, the Holy Spirit brings heaven to us. It's verses five and six, and... And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Right? So that is the gift of tongues. Now, Saint Bede again refers to St. Gregory the Theologian. Uh, he says, The apostles' speech had within itself the power such that it would be heard in the language of the hearer. Okay, so the miracle is in the speaking, he says, not the hearing. It's not that they were, were literally speaking in other languages, but somehow the, God imbued their word with the power such that it would be heard. Uh, so, of course, I mean, it's not a strict dichotomy. The, language, the miracle is in the speaking, not the hearing, but it's more the word itself had the power. Right? And so the people each heard it in whatever language they needed to hear it in. Moving on, and they were all amazed and marveled, of course, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus, Pontus in Asia, Bede says that the, the apostles here were all speaking in Hebrew, or all, all these people were speaking in Hebrew, but with local dialects. He says, thus Peter was recognized as a Galilean. Verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphyl Pamphylia in Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Who are the proselytes, right? These are pagans who chose circumcision, who chose to enter, uh, who became Jews, right? So often we don't really think of Judaism as a missionary religion. It doesn't really evangelize. And they're not really looking for converts, but it, not so. And not, uh, not, not supposed to be that way. And there were times in scripture, in history, where, you know, they did accept other people. Uh, the proselytes are pagans who chose circumcision in Judaism. And as Bede says, as Achior is said to have done in the book of Judith. Book of Judith is one of those, you could say, deuterocanonical books. For us, it's simply canonical. So Achior was a man who, he was an advisor to Holofernes. Holofernes is the ranking commander of Nebuchadnezzar's army, right? He, he told Holofernes you know, he shouldn't fight the Jews because the God of heaven, he said, will defend them. Interesting. He wasn't at this point a believer, but he said, 
Be careful. They got a mighty God on their side. A cure later, he learns that, well, Holofernes was actually beheaded by Judith. Uh, he recognizes this as the work of God, and he converts and is circumcised. He becomes a Jew. It doesn't matter that he was a Gentile. Cretes, moving on, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed, but they were also in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? I mean, it's on a human level, it's very understandable. <laughs> like, how is this happening? Of course, they're going to doubt. They're like, what is going on here? Verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine, right? They're mocking them. Uh, must be drunk. They must be like babbling, I guess, jibber jabbering, drunken ramblings. Beat says the, the mockers, you know, they meant it for evil. They meant, but God meant it for good. So never, he says the mockers, nevertheless, they mystically bore witness to truth. For they were not filled, you know, the, the, the disciples were not filled with the old wine, which ran short in the marriage of the church, but with the new wine of spiritual grace, right? He says, they were not filled with the old wine, which ran short, but now they are filled with the new wine of spiritual grace. He says, the apostles preach the wonderful works of God, not according to the oldness of the letter, but in the newness of the spirit, right? Cross-referencing Romans 7 there. Verses 14 and 15, but Peter standing up with the 11, again, Peter is in orthodoxy, we have no problem saying Peter is a leader. He's a preeminent apostle, but we don't take that to mean, of course, the same as the Catholics. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour, third hour of day. He says, like, come on, guys, it's... It's nine o'clock in the morning, right? First hour was seven in the morning. Third hour is nine, right? We still have these canonical hours of prayer in the church, first, third, sixth, and ninth. Although, you know, of course, typically we put them together because we can't actually uh, show up at church eight separate times a day. But third hour of the day would have been nine in the morning. She says, come on, guys. Obviously, they're not drunk. The bead says they notice that they received the Holy Spirit at, at an hour of prayer, right? The third hour was an hour of prayer. It shows the reader that it's not easy to receive the grace of the Holy Spirit unless the mind is raised from material things by concentration on the things which are above. Right? He's, his commentary on the very first verse said that transcend the abode of the flesh through, con through the uh, contemplation of the mind of the noose. Right? So they receive the Spirit at the hour of prayer to show that that's that's what you need. You need prayer. You need contemplation. You need to ascend. Uh, right. So he says, the Holy Spirit is sent at the third hour, 9 a.m. Christ ascends the cross at the sixth hour, noon. He yields up the ghost, his soul, at the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Uh, and so the hours, of, the hours of prayer are enjoined on us and sanctified, right? These major events of our salvation happened at the hours of prayer. Verses 16 and 17, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. All right, so this is Joel 2, 28 and, and, and onwards. The bead says, the Holy Spirit no longer is given to just individual prophets and priests, but to everyone in every place, regardless of sex, state of life, or position, right? In the church, and this was like a revolution in the ancient world. In the church, there is no male or female, right? They may have different roles, but as human beings, considering, you know, in terms of the possibility of salvation, men and women are absolutely equal. And of course, we know the greatest saint, uh, Christ, of course, is God. But if we take just the greatest human, is of course a woman, Mary the Theotokos. You know, we have many women who are equals to the apostles, right? St. Thecla, St. Nina, St. Helen. Um, it's probably some others. There's many great women saints. Regardless of 
spirit is given to everyone in every place, regardless of sex, state of life, or position, right? In terms of heaven, it doesn't matter if you're poor or if you're rich. Actually, you're right. You get to heaven and you're not going to be given a higher place because you were rich, right? There's, there, there's a story I remember seeing. Uh, there's an article in Mystagogy, I believe, that St. Constantine appeared as somebody, you know, St. Constantine, the emperor, Right. And he says, you know, if I had known the glory that awaited monastics, it's like I would have been a monk. Right. So the, the poor people who take the people taking vows of poverty are exp experiencing something far greater than him in the kingdom of heaven. Right. Not because. So it's not like become being a monastic makes you better automatically. Right. It's regardless of position. Uh, it's about. How much did they love God? How much were they detached from things created and attached to the uncreated? Obviously, being in a high position, having status, having riches, it's just there's extra obstacles for you. But anyone in any position, any sex, any status can attain the highest heights. All right? Bede says that the signs in heaven... There were signs in heaven when a new star appeared at Christ's birth, right? The sun dimmed at his crucifixion, and heaven itself was covered with darkness, right? Darkness covered the face of the earth when Christ died. It says there are signs on earth when Christ gave up his spirit and the earth shook, the graves opened, the rocks split, and the bodies of saints came forth alive, right? St. Ambrose of Milan, this is interesting, he points out, it says that it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out, I will pour out of my spirit. But he says he's not pouring out the spirit, he's pouring out from the spirit, of the spirit, because we can't receive the entirety of the spirit. It's not just like, here's the Holy Spirit for you. It's like, here's grace. Uh -huh. Verses 18 and 19 and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Okay, that's where the commentary about, I had that in the wrong spot, about signs in the heaven, signs on earth. It should have been here. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. First, I want to say verse 18, they shall prophesy, right? Prophesy doesn't always mean foretelling the future. Prophecy essentially means speaking the word of God, the word that God gives you. Moses was a prophet of the past. He saw creation happen. Moses wrote about times from before he was alive. That's prophecy. Some, you know, eldership in the church, uh, um, just confession, receiving a word from a priest. This is already prophecy. You know, you receive it, receive it as a word of, from God, not as a word from man. It's already, this is prophecy, speaking the word of God for that person, for the people of that time. Of course, it can be foretelling the future, but that's not, uh, prophecy doesn't have to mean that. So signs in heaven and earth, blood, fire, vapor, smoke. Bede says the blood, he refers here to the blood from the Lord's side, right? When the Lord was on the cross and they, um, pierced his side, not came blood and water, right? From the side of Christ came his bride, right? From the side of Adam came his bride, Eve. From the side of Christ comes um, basically the sacraments of the church, blood, obviously, the Eucharist, water, baptism, right? Pete says this, this blood from the Lord's side it is a sign of salvation, and it's a sign of the life that comes from his death, right? Christ's death is not he died but he rose again so his death is life-giving his death is life as far as fire he says this is the fire of the holy spirit the fire of the enlightening of the faithful as far as vapor he says the vapor of compunction and tears he says vapor is produced from the ardor of the holy spirit he says the vapor of smoke could also be referring to the blindness of the jews who didn't believe so you know, blinding them so a good kind of a positive interpretation to the vapor as well as a uh, more negative interpretation. 
He also says, Whence also, when about to give the law, the Lord descended in fire and smoke, because through the brilliance of his manifestation, he enlightened the humble, and through the murky smoke of error, he dimmed the eyes of the proud. All right. Let's see. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Let's move this up. Uh, Bede says, and others I, I noticed say, that this all occurred, the darkness, the moon into blood. This occurred partly at the Lord's passion, right? The sun was turned to darkness. But the moon turning into blood, they say that will be, that's coming. That's the future. This is coming before the day of judgment. And Theophylact here, referring to Josephus, actually, I think Theophylact is essentially following St. John Chrysostom, who I believe referred to Josephus. He says that such signs in the heavens also accompanied the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Right? That was a major event. The Jews, as we see here in, in the book of Acts, the Jews originally, the disciples, continued worshiping in the temple until it was destroyed. And then there's more of a clear break between the Jews and Christians. 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? Um, elsewhere, Peter says that God is not a respecter of persons, but those who fear him and work at justice from any nation are acceptable, right? Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord. Any nation from any status, as we said, any gender, any sex. Uh, interesting that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? But we also know from the Gospels that not all who cry out, Lord, Lord, will be saved, but only those who do the will of the Father. Right? Of course, you know, like maybe on the very, the most surface level reading, this is a contradiction. But of course, it's like in one case, it's crying out, it's saying just just the words crying out to the Lord do not save you just acknowledging that he is the Lord even does not save you even the, the demons believe and tremble so in, in this verse in Acts that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord it's clearly obviously it means with true faith with living faith and living faith is manifested in prayer it's manifested in worship it's manifested in good works it's manifested in virtue right this is all bound up here 22 and 23, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Obviously, it was wicked to crucify the Lord of glory. Right? It's interesting here, Jesus of Nazareth, Make, he's referring to the, the historical reality of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, right? Peter's preaching to the Jews. He's, he's, he's emphasizing more the humanity of, of Christ. Right? He's not denying the divinity of Christ, but he's kind of playing to his audience. He knows they're not, they're not quite ready. They're not really, perhaps they're not ready to jump right into the uh, hypostatic union, right? Uh, he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, right? Foreknowledge, not predestination in the sense of you know, Calvinism, but God foreknows all things. But what counsel is meant here? Bede says, well, the pre-eternal counsel, right? God is outside of time, right? Pre-eternal. And even that doesn't make sense because pre still means time. God is just totally timeless. Uh, we can use eternity is used two different ways. Sometimes we use eternity to refer to, to the timelessness of God. Sometimes eternity means uh, essentially the time that the angels live in, where it's like time is revolving on itself endlessly, right? It says this was the pre-eternal counsel of God, so the timeless counsel of God. That is a kind of expression of the will of God before the creation of the world. He says, St. Peter writes about this in his first epistle. He says, where, where Peter writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to these strangers, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
and Peter uh, later in the first chapter of his first epistle says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, right? He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God knew that man would fall. God knew that we would need our need a sacrifice and that it would, could only be God, right? In Revelation, it talks about the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Well, it depends on how you translate that verse. Uh, many many translations actually say that it's it's speaking to referring to were, were your names recorded in the book of the book of life from before the foundation of the world and the lamb was slain right but in any case sometimes people try to ref use this argument to say like kind of make these wonky ideas about time oh the lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world don't you see it's all happening outside time even Christ's humanity was outside time uh, time is flexible there's no one perspective of time. No, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, right? You can't take John so literally um, in the Revel book of Revelation. I, I haven't found a single patristic father who has commented on that verse and said that somehow Christ was actually human already from before the foundation of the world, that sometime, somehow he was actually slain from before the foundation of the world because God is outside time, so which if that's what it meant, that would be a major point that the fathers would have to comment on. You know, Bede has commentary on Revelation. He doesn't say anything like that. In fact, many fathers just kind of pass over that line. And I think it's actually because it's meant to be translated as Dr. Jeannie Constantino translates it this way, as do many translations. That it's referring to like the, were the people written in the book of the Lamb, the book of life from before the foundation of the world? Were they foreordained? Right? Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, right? He's still he's emphasizing, speaking of Christ more as a man, whom God raised him up, not that, not that Christ raised himself up, but scripture also does talk about Christ raising himself up. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? And that, that, that's speaking to the divinity of Christ. It was not possible that he should be holden of it. Why? Because he's God, he is life. So first Peter's, pricking their conscience with righteous fear to then more advantageously devote his talk to the plan of salvation, right? Bede says, because he's talking to the Jews who knew the law, he shows that Christ is the one that the prophet spoke of. Um, this is what Peter is doing in this homily. This calls Christ a man, the Bede says, but his unique resurrection is a testimony to his eternal divinity, right? Other bodies remain, first of all, remain in the grave. They corrupt, they decay. But Christ was immune, being says, to human intemperance, uh, human impermanence. Why? Because he's God. How else could he be? Otherwise, he couldn't be immune to human impermanence. Peter also proves that Christ exceeded the merits of the human condition and should therefore be considered God, right? So again, Peter's not hiding the divinity of Christ, but he's, being smart in how he refers to it. Plus, the Theophylact talks about how death, he kind of like humanizes it, anthropomorpha, anthropomorphizes it as the hymns of the church do and stuff. And death was tormented by taking Christ, right? If death takes on life, guess who's going to lose? Christ comes from a, Christ obviously resurrects. He comes from the tomb like a womb. Right? He comes forth from the womb of the virgin, which was also in a, which was in a cave. And now he comes forth from the tomb, which was in a cave. Christ is the firstborn of the dead, right? It's spoken of as a new birth. Death can't hold him for two reasons. Because he's sinless. As a man, he's sinless. He was undeserving of death. Um... His death was undeserved and it was unjust because his conception was not preceded. His conception was not in pleasure, right? It was virgin. So he, he broke the pleasure pain dialectic. But we'll, we'll stick to talking about the fact that he was sinless and so it was undeserved. Well, and because he's God, he is life itself. 
Verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So this is Psalm 15 slash 16, right? Hebrew and Greek numbering is different. Bede here quotes St. Augustine saying, coming to things which pass away, I did not take away my eyes from him, him who always remains, right? I kept my vision focused on Christ, which is the point of our lives, right? We need to do the same. Thus foreseeing that I might return to him after temporal things have been finished, right? There's coming a time when everything's just going to be all about Christ. It is now, but it's going to be manifest. For he shows favor to me so that, I, so that I may remain steadfastly in him. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. Theophylact points out that David is speaking as if from Christ. Right, The Psalms are, are the words of Christ through the mouth of David. He calls the Father the Lord of Jesus. But here he said, he interesting, he says, the Father is on the right hand of Jesus in this, for he is on my right hand, it says. The Father is on the right hand of Jesus. At other times, Jesus is on the Father's right hand. Right? This is showing their equality. God is on the right hand of God. <laughs> Verse 26, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Why hope? Okay, obviously on account of the resurrection, which has sent the world, set the world free, right? That's our hope. If Christ is risen, nothing else matters. If Christ isn't risen, nothing else matters, right? Yaroslav Pelikan, right? Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, right? This is David but this is obviously talking about Christ. Christ is the Holy One who doesn't see corruption. We just said he rose again. His body didn't corrupt. This was this was un, with the unbecoming of Christ. Again, so Bede is quoting St. Augustine, again, speaking as if it's Christ. Moreover, my flesh will not vanish in dissolution, but will fall asleep in the hope of resurrection. For you will not give my soul over to the possession of hell, I mean, Christ in his soul descended into Hades, the realm of the dead, but it was not possessed by Hades. Christ was in control. He, he, allowed, his hypo, he allowed his hypostases as a human. His, he allowed his human nature to be torn apart, body and soul separated. Um, he, he allowed himself to experience that blameless passion, that blameless consequence of the fall, and yet... Hell did not take possession of him. He remained in control of it. Okay, St. Augustine continues, Nor will you allow my sanctified body, through which others are also to be sanctified, to be corrupted. Right? We are saved. Christ's body is our vehicle for salvation, right? His body died. He died in his body. He rose again in the flesh. He gives us his flesh. We are baptized into his flesh. Blood and water came from his side. Right, we are baptized into his um, his virgin birth in baptism. His flesh is the vehicle of our salvation. Verse twenty-eight: Thou hast made me, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. This is referring to this is quoting the, from the last verse of Psalms fifteen, Psalm fifteen sixteen which finishes with, and at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And Bede says, this is the ascension. Christ returns to the right hand of God. 29 to 31, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day, right? David, a great man, a king, and yet he's still dead. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, According to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, right? So, right, obviously David is, as a prophet, he's referring to the resurrection of Christ. Bede says, in fact, Christ did indeed descend with respect to his soul, to those in hell, Hades, so that he might come to the aid of those for whom it was necessary but he was not abandoned in hell. 
because returning immediately, he sought his body, which was to rise again, right? His, his human nature is reunited, right? His soul and body are reunited immediately. 32 and 33, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, right? Christ made public appearances. This wasn't like, it's not just like, oh, hey, Muhammad spoke to an angel in a cave in private. But just believe me, so Christ appeared and said, here I am, and Scripture gives us their names. And Scripture was written at a time when these people were still alive. Scripture was as if daring people to go seek them out and confirm what they had seen. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which we you now see and hear. He has sent forth the Spirit, which ye now see and hear. We see in the tongues of fire, and we hear in the apostolic discourse. St. Augustine says, both natures of Christ are revealed. He received the Spirit as a man, and he poured him forth as God. Right? Spirit ascended in Christ. Christ. Christ means anointed. He's anointed with the Spirit in his baptism, and then he pours him forth as God. Verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens, right? No man ascended into the heavens, only Christ. But he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand, right? Two lords here. The Lord said unto my Lord, right? Christ refers to this in the Gospels. This is Psalm 109, 110. Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies, thy foes, thy footstool. Theophilus says, who's the foe of Christ? What does scripture say is the last enemy? Death. It's our last enemy, right? Death is our enemy. Sin is our enemy. Christ understands that um, we can't defeat it ourselves. He defeats it for us. Let's scroll up. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Right? He's speaking, it's like the Jews, Jews corporately as a nation uh, have crucified Christ, is the way Peter's referring to it. Whom ye have crucified, right? Both Lord and Christ, he was made. But of course we know it was the flesh. Christ suffered in his flesh. Christ the person of Christ died. The person of Christ suffered, but in his flesh, not his divinity. Divinity is impassable. 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay. It's good. Right? They heard apostolic preaching. They heard grace-filled preaching. They recognized it for what it was, and they said, okay, what do we need to do? Imagine, like, so simple today people get upset oh he told me i'm wrong and they're pointing out that we need to change blah blah blah. Which, except yeah you do accept it ask what should i do next pete says this is here is the fulfillment of joel's prophecy after the fire of the holy spirit there followed the vapor of compunction for smoke tends to cause tears he says of course tears of compunction he's referring to uh they beat their breasts present their prayer to God as sacrifice. It says before they crawled Christ's blood down upon themselves, right? And upon their children. They said, let his blood be upon us. But now they taste of it. And now they partake of Holy Communion. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Sing. Bede refers to St. Gregory the Great saying that Peter mentions repentance, then baptism, so that they would pour over themselves the water of their sorrow, he says, and afterwards wash themselves in the sacrament of baptism, right? So a basic outline of this sermon that Peter's giving is Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. That Christ is risen, so repent and be saved, right? Repent and be baptized, be baptized. Be baptized. This is a command of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, right? Of course, in the Gospels, it says the holy name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in Orthodoxy, we do believe that that's you have to be baptized in the name of the Trinity. But that's because 
we know that the name of Christ and the name of the Trinity is the same, right? The name, plural, singular name for Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's many heresies that confuse the Trinity, that confuse who Christ is. So we can't really, uh, so we, we, we maintain the practice that you're baptized thrice in the name of the Trinity. Um, there's no contradiction here. And you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost, right? Christ says to be baptized. 39, for, for the promise, St. Peter says, is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right? So this is undoing Matthew 27, 25, when they said, his blood be on us and on our children. Right? At the crucifixion, like, when they're calling for him to be crucified, let his blood be upon us. We'll, we'll take the blame. Sure, whatever. Here they're saying, Peter's saying, the promise is unto you and to your children. God is allow is ex will accept your repentance. God will accept you back, right? Peter had his own experience of this, right? Peter thrice denied and was thrice restored. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you lo love me? Peter, do you love me? Serve my, you know, feed my sheep. Um, 40, 40 and forty one, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourselves from this untoward generation." Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Short, short catechism, right? One, one sermon. But these were people, these were people who, you know, it was like their whole history was preparing them for this time. Nowadays, we tend to have much that we need to unlearn, much that we need to relearn to make sure that we are truly ready for the church, that we won't flake out and leave when the church's baptism here is being celebrated for the first time divine mercy mercy providentially gathered three thousand souls bead says three thousand for the profession of the holy trinity right bead loves numbers three thousand trinity on the 50th day after passover when the law was given Moses ordered a festival of fruits to be introduced, right? The Passover, um, Pentecost is commemoration of when the law, but it's also the festival, you know, this festival of first fruits. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit, it's not the sheaves of grain, but the first fruits of souls, right? That are consecrated to the Lord, souls. We now are spiritually, we are to give our best. Um, of course, we do also continually to materially provide to the church, to the poor. We give alms. We should at least tithe. At least tithe, we should. It's interesting in Exodus 32, when Moses is on the mount receiving the Ten Commandments and the people are worshiping the calf. Moses, you know, when Moses learns of this, it says about 3,000 are killed. Here, when grace comes, instead of the law, 3,000 spiritually die and rise again, right? It's probably not, probably not uh, a coincidence that it's 3,000. 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, again, all in one accord, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Again, we see, what is breaking of bread, right? That's the Eucharist. This is pretty well recognized by scholars, by the fathers, by everyone. That this is referring to the Eucharist. And in prayers, it should be the prayers. Again, this is it's referring to liturgical, like hours of prayer. We know that they're going to the temple. Again, sacraments and worship go together with the truth. They're continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine that allows them to fellowship together, which allows them to receive communion together. Communion is a sacrament of fellowship and they pray together. These all go together. If you take out the doctrine, the rest falls apart. If you can't, if you don't have common faith, you shouldn't have common prayer. I mean, that's just how it is. Fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, right? Many wonders and signs. Remember Christ said that we would do greater things Right? Of course, it's Christ acting in us. It's the Holy Spirit acting in us. But he's pleased 
to use us to to have us present have us to be witnesses to him to the world he's pleased to work through us again let's go back to joshua in jericho if you remember there was one family who was spared that of rahab but in acts 3000 were baptized right right it's like a faithful remnant is taken out and, be, and becomes the seed of the new covenant here, Jerusalem is filled with fear, right? Fear came upon every soul. But in Joshua 5, 1, great fear comes upon the enemy when they hear that God had delivered Israel. How? Through the Jordan, right? Baptism. And Rahab also, she also later says that great fear had come upon Jericho, right? So the Holy baptism of the Holy Spirit, great fear. Jews saved through the Jordan, fear. Verse 44. Let us scroll. Almost done here. Just a couple more. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common, right? If Beat says, if the love of God pervades our hearts, it'll soon engender affection for our neighbor as well, right? Uh, we know this, this was a characteristic of the earliest Christians that they shared all things in common. But this is, sometimes people try to say this is communism, right? It's better to say, I think, communalism, right? This is voluntary. They weren't giving up everything, giving it to the government for the government to then redistribute. They were just voluntarily sharing all things in common. 45, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, right? See, they themselves are distributing as every man had need. This is a great token of brotherly love, Beat says, right? Taking care of the less fortunate, Christ says, that's a criteria of how we will be judged. 46, and they continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. See, they're still doing liturgical temple prayer in one accord and breaking bread from house to house. The Eucharist, agape meals, probably also refers to just eating together. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Again, it's always one accord, one accord, one accord. Continuing in the doctrine, singleness of heart, same name on their lips, same name in their hearts. Right? Con liturgical life is continuing in the temple while the Eucharist is being celebrated in the homes. Of course, eventually these will unite in the liturgy. Or... Verse 47, last verse, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Right? I can't remember now, but which one of the fathers that I looked at said, why did they have favor with all the people? It's like, well, basically because they were kind of like their social ministry taking care of them. But of course, you know, there's the people that uh, love and appreciate the truth that they're preaching, that they're bringing them into the church daily, such as should be saved. People are being added daily, right? And this is probably continuing till today. You know, it's not literally daily, but how often do we see these reports of like 50 were baptized in Kenya? 200 were baptized in Nigeria, right? A missionary visited the Philippines and baptized them all in the ocean, right? And then this is in addition to just I mean, several parishes at Pasca had huge baptisms, huge conversions. Uh, and this is in addition to just the people that are entering the church th throughout the year, right? God is pleased. God is bringing the whole world into the church and he's bringing the church to the whole world. We are bringing... We are called to bring the church to the whole world. And of course, Pentecost gives us the grace, the, 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 um, the vigor, the strength. The Spirit gives us the utterance of what we need to say. This all comes from our baptism in water, our baptism in the Holy Spirit, our baptism in fire. Yeah. And of course, and that is all made possible by the fact that Christ is risen. See you next time.